Welcome to The Quill and the Quantum, the podcast where we explore the intersection of artificial intelligence and the art of writing. I'm your host, Kathy Norris, and in each episode, we'll talk to those authors and other creatives who use or refuse to use AI in their writing process. Today's guest is James Cox, award-winning writer and director. James's films have premiered at the Sundance Film Festival and the Toronto Film Festival. But what we're going to talk to James about today is his inaugural novel, his, his first thriller with the, cap- oh, the captivating name, Grand Theft AI. Dun, dun, dun. Look at that cover, will you? Really nice. So we're going to be talking about a Oh, Grand Theft. Oh, boy, it's silver and blah. Oh, it's oh. iridescent. It's iridescent. Yeah. That's the word I'm searching for. Yeah, this is Blackstone. Thank you so much, Blackstone. Yeah, Blackstone, because because your your book came out July of 2024, correct? Yes, just uh, not even a week ago. Not even a week ago. So the, yeah. they're, they're, it looks like a, 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 a quality act that you've uh, signed up with here, James. So wonderful it's a beautiful book it's a wonderful team i'm really grateful and i'm grateful to be on the podcast thank you for having me on well um as i said we were just fascinated or i'm just fascinated by the idea of someone who works in the visual media such as films and music videos transitioning to writing novels so can you tell us a little bit about grand theft ai and also why you decided to move from from visual to written uh written endeavors yeah, you know, um, I I had a really it it it's been a long process, so I'll try and get there get there quickly. But I had a young, fortunate break in this business. I came, you know, I grew up in Northern California making movies in my backyard, and I <laughs> uh, went to Berkeley for a couple years and got myself to NYU, where I was that kid you hear about every once in a while with a red hot short that just exploded. It won at Sundance, it won a Student Academy Award, sold to HBO, and um, it took off in town. Uh, My first three meetings were Ridley Scott, Jerry Bruckheimer, and Mike DeLuca. And all I know, and all three of them uh, put me in business. We got into business on day one with a pitch with Jerry and uh, Ridley signed me to RSA and Mike hired me at New Line to do a $14 million studio picture so I couldn't even graduate from film school. It was just such a rocket ship. and I think that that trajectory really kind of hit its height at the Toronto Film Festival a few years later with a movie that I did with Val Kilmer called Wonderland. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it was a haunted set. It's uh, based on a true crime, this grisly quadruple homicide that went down in the Hollywood Hills. And uh, Val was possessed. Um, and it was, a, it was a tremendous experience. And I think the... You know, we ended up screening it for Francis Coppola in mm-hmm. his private screening room at the winery and whatnot. And I mean, it, it caught the eyes of legends like Michael Mann and um, Robert Pound, Bob Zemeckis, mm-hmm. uh, a guy who would prove influential in my career, Shane Salerno. And um, I just, I honestly, I didn't know how fortunate I was because it wasn't soon after that, that my demons got the better of me. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I was just someone who always loved going out, you know, loved partying in New York City because that city never sleeps. But I just couldn't draw the line between work hard and play hard. It was all just one big juggernaut of energy. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, then my dad died and I just kind of tumbled. And um, it took a long time. You know, my life got really small and eventually, um, you know, after I you know, embarrassed myself in very professional situations and uh, offended some super talented people and blew huge opportunity after huge opportunity showing up unprepared to critical professional moments. Eventually, you know, I woke up, you know, and this was Thanksgiving 2013. So it was a while ago and I was in San Francisco uh, on Union Square and I just, something blew through me. And I just realized I was done running, you know, done numbing. And I got back to Los Angeles and uh, faced up to who I'd become and and, uh, figuring out who the real me was. And, you know, did a lot of writing. 
mm-hmm. you know, deep in the well stuff, uh, not just creative, but personal, really like finding my true voice. And which kind of gets to the real heart of your question, because I'd gone through this real kind of journey to the heights, to the depths, a lot of soul searching. Uh, and then my next picture, my latest, my last picture came together quick. Uh, it was called Billionaire Boys Club. And, you know, um, I struggled throughout that picture. I mean, it was an arduous logistics and it was um, a lab- labyrinthian true crime, but really it was like the main character that was really hard to get right because uh, he's a guy who's still in prison to this day, Joe Hunt. And um, I think, you know, that project dated back to my darkest days and my death wish fascination with condemned souls. And, you know, I just struggled with like, is this a cautionary tale that needs to be told? Or is this some too twisted, you know, narrative of, you know, white privileged young men from Beverly Hills who commit horrible financial crimes until it all spins out of control. And then they commit horrible, violent crimes. You know, (laughs) this was like 2017, 2018, Mm -hmm. you know, and so our commercial prospects in post-production are dimming substantially because the world's changing quickly. And um, so when that movie cratered, after everything that I had been through, um, you can bet I was in a therapist's office that week, you know, like three of them, uh, literally just going, what is, what's next? Mm-hmm. You know, and I wanted to say, screw it. Uh, but I'd been down that road before and I knew where it went. So instead I just did the only thing that I knew that I really know how to do well. I just started writing. Wow. And I, uh, I wrote what I really loved as a kid. Like back when I was 10 years old, making movies in my backyard, Star Wars, Alien, Aliens, Predator, you know, The well, Matrix, Grand Theft Blade AI. Runner. It's What's true, that? The Grand Theft AI is a, is a, a, a cape, it's, it's a heist movie. And I was and and I was wondering, is, is that something that you enjoyed as a child in your in your youth as well? Well, I think the world building, yes, and the sci-fi and that element, coupled with, you know, what I'd, you know, I'd found a real passion for professionally. Mm-hmm. Um, when I stood up at NYU, I was like, you had to introduce yourself in your your favorite movie, you know? So I was like, Oh, I'm James Cox. I love two movies. I love raging bull and I love star Wars. And for the first half of my career, you know, I really pursued that kind of raging bull passion, fact based, historical, true crime stuff that basically goes by the mantra. This happened. Mm -hmm. And you know, the dam burst one night X amount of years ago, this was after Billionaire Boys Club when the smoke finally settled. I'd been beat up really bad as a writer. Uh, Just kind of came to a point where I put the pen down figuratively, literally, and was I hadn't written for a year and a half uh, through a long, tough post process. And I knew something was gathering in me. I knew it was stuff that was more, you know, elemental to me. Mm -hmm. and then it just exploded like one night it just I I mean it was fast and furious like I was breaking keyboards wow I saw the sunrise like seven nights in a row it was just burning the midnight oil and just attacking it we in my line you know in in Hollywood you don't always write in screenplay format you know you're writing treatments you're writing scissors you're writing stuff Uh that's supporting documents so there was this voice that had been gathering in me that had a lot I mean I I don't say it like this but my writing partner would he was like it had a lot of spit on it (laughs) you know what I mean aka style yeah okay but it was very mine you know um so it just all came out like that and it was this whole world that was you know, those, the influences I've mentioned, you know, some of my favorite literary cyberpunk stuff like Snow mm-hmm. Crash and the Sprawl Trilogy by William Gibson. And it just, 
and it was like bots and brain computer interfaces it's, and a government that's everywhere beginning and yes. ending in your head. You know, and I've seen you light up. You're like, okay, enough of the stuff that you did before. Let's talk about your it, damn it, book. You seriously. Know? Because, I know, because, right. Yeah, so it's I like, go, you know, but anyway, so yeah, it just it came out. It just, I just ripped it and it was, you know, it was a lot of the stuff when I was in New York, right? Mm -hmm. Where it was like, that kind of like life happens after 4 a.m. or whatever you want to call it. you know, like the kind of the, the stuff where, you know, after midnight, after hours, that kind of stuff, coupled with where I came from, which is Silicon Valley, with the stuff mm -hmm. that I love that is sci-fi and, you know, just really detailed world building stuff. And it comes from my true crime background. Like if I'm going to write something that takes place on a certain weekend in 1981 or, you know, I've adapted a Norman Mailer that took place during the Deer Park took place in um, the Red Scare. I just immerse myself okay. with everything, you know, the what's on the radio. Like I always ask myself about a quick character, like what song did they slow dance to at oh my prom goodness. and where? So you right? really do build from the ground up, it sounds like. Kind of, yeah. I mean, I always have this interior life that is, you know, usually can be really reduced down to like, you know, like with Rhea, like don't flatter yourself. Yeah, I don't yeah. trust anyone. Uh, and let's let's talk let's that's a great segue into talking about the book which which um has been Sorry. described as uh what was that uh the matrix meets blade runner and i thought that, that was was really interesting uh you built a world that i think most readers are going to be vaguely familiar with i mean everything from the iphone 30 to the idea that um, all intelligent systems are regulated by Uncle Sam to to corporations behaving badly like Coca-Cola stealing all the fresh water, um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the labor unions negotiating the impact of AI on wages, uh, just like SAG-AFTRA. And, mm -hmm. and uh, by the way, I love the idea workers are entitled to costs saved by the robots replacing them. I just, I just love that. But anyway, the extinction tax, the extinction tax, the, and, and the one that was most fascinating, the, the one that's most clearly, I think, um, uh, has parallels in today is wet wires, um, wet wires and the idea of Elon Musk's Neuralinks. Um, yeah. uh, just, it just seemed right on time. So this is this, it, 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 it that your your novel takes place in 2051 talk to us about your uh, uh, your your choice of of set it, why you decided to set it in 2051 you know there was no i don't know exactly where that came from except for like as i was building out the, so what happened was that like you know I'm, I'm you know when this all when all this stuff exploded it came in the form of character bios Okay. So I kind of had an opening scene in my mind, you know, that was like a deal gone bad, deal gone mm -hmm. wrong. And I had this woman in my mind and I had like this guy in my mind. I had his like Rio in my mind. I had a bad guy. I had all this stuff that was in my mind of like, yeah. and I just, I knew that like there was so much detail and I knew, I just knew it. I, cause like you said, it's like, it's a relatively familiar landscape cyberpunk. And like at mm -hmm. the end of the day, you know, it's. I think you could say a friend of mine who is, you know, we came out of film school together and he went music and I went film. He had something that he said, he's like, every song has been written. Yeah. I, so he says, I, every song has been written. As soon as you sit novel. there and go, wow, every song has been written and musicians will go crazy about that. But what it's liberating. You know, like, okay, well, if every song has been written, then how, if I'm going to write a song, is mine going to be unique, you know, and you go ahead. Oh, no, I'm thinking that that's it exactly. It's just like saying every every story has been written, every song has been written. Certain tropes are are just endemic or are 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 part of the human story. But your love story and my love story are going to be different based on the people that we are. And there's an audience out there um, uh, that will that will. What am I trying to say? These themes are universal, and even though our stories are different people reading them or watching them are going to connect because these, these stories are universal. I think you kind of nailed it. Like I, there, there, 
I think in cyberpunk dystopia, you know, you get, I, I just found, um, I like, how do I say it right? Like there was a love story and there were characters that uh, had been beaten up and were battle scarred. Yes. And at the same time, despite, I'll get all choked up here. You know, it's like that. It's like in Raging Bull, you never knock me down, Ray. Mm. You never knock me down. Right. Like, you know, Baz is like a Timex, man. He can take a lick him, but he keeps on ticking. Like it just, and he's, it's like, I remember of, like in Kirk Douglas in like, you know, uh, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea when I was a kid. It's like, you saved my life. Why? I don't know. <laughs> you know? And, and so that moral compass that existed within this world, I, I couldn't find it uh -huh. the way I wanted it to be. And so I was like, okay, well, I'm just going to write it myself. You know? And that was, yeah, that that was kind of what... When that, when all the smoke settled off of that seven or eight nights, I had about 60 pages of, I don't know what you would call them, like short stories. <laughs> I they would were, love to see what that looks like. I mean, I, was it, it was it, was it paper? Was it, was it something that you had done on a paper. laptop? No, yeah, no it, 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 yeah, it wasn't, it was, a, it was a file. It would, it printed. I sent him to a couple, a, a close friend who was actually was in a number of, those backyard movies, very okay. literate guy, very sci-fi head, very similar influences. Um, and he was like, dude, there is, this is, and he reads like everything, you know, Heinlein, sure. Neville, all of it. Like he's just super literary and he, he just was like literate. And he was like, dude, you know, this is, and I could hear it. And well, he's someone who I really respect. And I was like, huh. And then it became a screenplay. Okay. And then I was developing the screenplay uh, to take it to market. And I was pitching a rewrite to someone and I read him a scene out of one of these things. And I sent it to him because he wanted to see it. And then he had us and he's in the industry and he had, you know, so, and then I started to really catch the same fire from everybody that there was something larger here than just a screenplay. Oh, well, I, I think what is I, one of my favorite moments, um, near the end of the book is when Otto is finally, Otto has to open up and make himself vulnerable in order for the heist to succeed. And I thought that was so, I get chills. That's so powerful and gripping That's and so true. Cool. Thank you, know? you for reading it. Thank you for at least coming close to finishing it, if not actually finishing it. You got oh, that far. That's fantastic. Oh yeah. Well, it was, it was just, you know, if, 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 um, what can I say? It's, it's, it's a universal truth. It, it, it's, and I thought, oh, you know, as soon as I read it, I thought, oh, this is going to be the end of Otto. I mean, I know, you know, vulnerability, but, but, but anywho. Um, okay. Yeah. Like, it's funny. Cause you know, that, that what you just described, I think the genre so often gets stuck in um, theme and okay. meditations on what it means to be human and is this real or isn't this real and starts to get stuck in conceptual stuff and gets so oftentimes a sci-fi book will start phenomenal mm -hmm. and then you're just like get to the end and you're it's like so heady and i was like i grew up loving you know ripley and hicks and neon ripley and, ripley yeah, you know yes, Han Leia, my favorite you know movie, like aliens. indian marion you know yes. i love these things and so those you know, you, you, you can't get lost in theme or con. I mean, you can, you know, like you, there you can, but like in order for the audience to come back and watch it over and over again and, and over fall and in love with it. And for me to fall in love with it, it's got to have like, you know, like when they, I get all choked up, but when like, you know, right before they wheel the arc out into the warehouse that gets uh -huh. lost forever in government bureaucracy and Raiders of the Lost Ark, going, yeah. They don't know what they got and she's like yeah but i know what i've got you know and i'm, I'm like a hopeless romantic you know Ho well, accent on the hopeless part universal themes it, it it works and i think that one of the things too that i enjoyed about the book and and you'll tell me if i've got this right or, or not it, you know if the question is uh, is 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 ai an assistance to humankind 
Um, is it going to help us, you know, think better and be better, or is it a threat? I thought after the end of Grand Theft AI that you were leaving that question open and that you hadn't made a decision one way or the other uh, uh, about, about AI and humankind. Is that, was that your intention or did I get it wrong or, or do you have a message? Um, well, there's a lot to unpack in that question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and you can slice off any little piece of it that your heart desires. Well, I think there's a lot of ways to go. Um, one of the things, I fact, I fact, I might even read you. Oh, please excerpt. do, please do. Yeah, I might. Oh, that I would should. be that would be awesome. I I I had one one quote that I I enjoyed. I I want to hear what you've got. Well, it kind of gets down to it. So it's like. Dave was the only one who laughed at a fully sentient yet harmlessly benign BDSM bot under interrogation from the underground's engineers. When asked why it wanted no vengeance for an all-night flogging from a client, this hyper-submissive ragdoll named Roxy replied without batting an eye, why? Do you think that would arouse him? Pressed further, what if he was about to beat the battery out of her? Her answer hung in the air. Termination of my BIOS is a cessation of work, and I think an entirely good and pleasant thing. Who knew a fuckbot could find the Buddha in a nanosecond? I remember reading that. I remember reading that. Oh, my goodness. So, And I can tell from your smile, it's one of those passages that you've really enjoyed. I did, yes. And it was. it's one of the, some of these things are date back to that first vomit. Mm -hmm. And that's one of them. Like there was definitely some stuff that, and the, and the thing was, was that like, I think meditating on what it means to be human and mm. what's the difference between man and machine is amazingly brilliant and so cool. And I love all the movies that have done it. They're my favorite movies, whether it be 2001, the matrix or terminator, you know, and then it just list goes on and on of movies in which, you know, a robot or an AI or a synergy of the two of them, you know, you're trying to figure out, you know, what makes, you know, the man a machine and the machine a man type of thing. Mm -hmm. And I just, um, but I, I feel, I don't know, I didn't have anything to add to that. And I don't know if there is anything to add to that. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's just like, okay. And it does end up becoming this, almost like you paint yourself into a corner and I'll also like, you know, there's a bunch of AI researchers out there who are like, the idea that like this, you know, artificial intelligence being afraid of deactivation and death is preposterous. That is, I mean, you could code it to be afraid of that, but then it's just a, another tool, mm -hmm. which is what it always is. The idea that like, you know, that it's going to be afraid of the, that's an entirely human condition. And so it's like anthropomorphizing something that is most likely going to be vastly more sophisticated than, you know, some, some human who's afraid of death. And so I just felt like for so many different reasons, I was just uninterested in that. What mm -hmm. I was interested in was the humans who live within a world that has been rapidly changing way too fast for way anyone to take fast. to to keep up with and that the AIs are essentially, you know, uh, highly evolved tools that are smarter than the, the, their creators. And as I was like, that's just really fascinating. I mean, we already have that. This computer can remember shit. I can't remember, you know, oh, so yeah. we already have versions of that and I don't know. So that was kind of my take on, you know, AI was, I just didn't want to get stuck in the same place where you've been before. And I think at the end of the day, you know, an AI is not going to replace you. Someone who's using AI is going to replace, replace you, you. Yes. you know, and I wouldn't be afraid of AI. I'd be afraid of the people that own the AIs. Totally. Um, I, I would totally agree with that. Uh, I know we are getting near the end of our, our time. Um, let me ask, is there anything that, that you would want to discuss that we haven't covered so far? I want to make sure that I get your major points in.
uh, realjamescox.com. Okay. <laughs> that is my website, realjamescox.com uh, or jamescoxbooks.com. It's that goes to the same website where you will find buy buttons for Grand Theft AI. Very, um, very nice. Yeah, it Real is. It, it does have quite, it, you know, it has a a uh, a Blade Runner meets Matrix world. It's got a style. You've never read any sci-fi that sounds like this. It's kind of got oh, a street no. vernacular, like well, out of train spotting or something. When you had a bot that was uh, was dancing the nene or something, I was like, oh, M G <laughs> O M G. You know, it was like I mean, little little details, little, little details. Just just make it, you know, like I said, I I, I was like, this is just too cool. Is this the first of a series, do you think? Or is it standalone? Yeah, you know, you but, well, you know, when Blackstone, you know, when I eventually took it to my mentor, Shane Salerno, who eventually then we worked it together, we took it to Blackstone Publishing and they flipped for it. They they didn't just buy the uh, this book; they bought the sequel too. Good, the eyes good. Yeah. Of a, of a, and you know, by when I um, so when I was finishing the proof on this book, I was also finishing the manuscript to book two. Okay. The week that my daughter was born. Well, congratulations on that most important of events. Is this your first child? It she is, and oh. you know it's it's crazy. It's like. It changes everything. It changes, well, it changes your sleep schedule, <laughs> but it does, it changes, you know, it changes how you interact with your material, with your profession, with everything. You know, it's like now there's, there's so much more at stake with how I interact and what I'm working on and the characters I write and how we treat one another because I'm shaping a life now. Yes. And, and I think it makes the, the questions of the, of, of the future that much more urgent. I mean, but yeah. congratulations um, on that. And Thank congratulations you. on Grand Theft AI. Um, Thank you so much. It, it was, is, I have to say, it is, it is the best thing that I've ever done. Oh, you must feel so stoked about to be able to say that. I, I do. I, I, I said it, I wrote it, and I, I didn't realize how true it was. You know, the, the only other time I've ever felt this good about my work, you know, went on to win a Student Academy Award. The other one went all the way to Coppola's house and the Toronto Film Festival. And so I just, you know, I'm just so, I'm grateful to, grateful all around. You know, the idea that, I mean, the, the blessing, the luck that anyone... Mm -hmm might read something I wrote that I get to share my dreams. You know, it's just sensational. And uh, thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, thank you oh, for thank Black to Blackstone for, you know, delivering this. Thank you to, I've got to thank you to Josh and Stephanie Stanton at Blackstone <laughs> Publishing, Josie Woodbridge, my editor, Diana Gill, my copy editor, Michael Crane. They all brought the lumber. My, uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Perfectionism at work. I thank them then. I thank them again. Oh, thank I love you. it. You're one of the, I, I can't remember an author who has thanked the 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 wind beneath their wings, as it were. Oh, and 100%. And I have to say, I will thank Shane Salerno, this force of nature who uh, is always gets the best out of me. Thank you so much.